Good morning. This is Neil Paulhemus. I'm uh, glad to welcome you all to the first of our winter webinars. Um, the topic today is an interesting one. It's analyzing data from stability studies. Uh, this involves using a new procedure that we added to Stack Graphics 19, which um, has particular applications in uh, to pharmaceutical companies and, and other sorts of companies. Uh, it's a procedure that uh, if you need it, uh, I think it uh, is uh, would be very useful and important to you. And uh, I definitely want to give you an idea of what we've implemented, how we've implemented the stability studies procedure. And I'll be going through uh, an example uh, of a typical data set. Now, as usual, um, the GoToWebinar series has the ability for you to send questions. And the way we run these webinars is I try to talk for somewhere between a half an hour and 45 minutes, and then spend some uh, minutes answering whatever questions you might have. Um, also, if, if you have a difficulty, if for some reason you're not seeing a screen right now that says Stack Graphics 19 across the top, um, you uh, might want to let me know uh, about that as well. Okay. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about stability studies. Stability studies model how a product or perhaps a component of a product varies with time. Okay, how does it change over time? The um, Stability studies are typically used to either establish either a shelf life or perhaps a retest period for a particular product or maybe a component uh, of that product. A common use, very common use, is modeling the degradation of a drug product or a substance. It's a procedure that's recommended by the FDA in order to establish how long you can keep a particular product on the shelf or at what point you need to retest uh, perhaps the potency of the product. Okay. Now, the sample data set we're going to look at is a data set that's shipped with version 19 of Stat Graphics. It's called shelflifestudy.sgd. Okay, the dependent variable, the variable we're trying to model, is the percent of the label claimed active ingredient strength of the drug. Okay, now <clears throat> that percent of the label claimed strength is likely to vary, likely to go down somewhat over time. And what we need to do is determine how long uh, that strength is adequately high uh, that we can uh, still continue to use uh, that particular drug. In this particular data set, measurements have been made on five different batches. We've taken five batches of the drug and we've taken samples between zero months and 48 months after it was produced. So samples anywhere from immediately after it was produced until four years later. There is a spe lower specification limit for the percent of label claimed strength. Okay, we require the samples in order to be usable to have 90% um, of that label claimed strength. That is the lower specification. Okay, now, what we need to do here um, 
is first take a look at the data. Uh, I've used that graphics here to give you a plot of the sample data. And you can see there are samples from five batches. Um, they're color coded here. So you can see the five batches. And at various times, anywhere from zero, I'm sorry, I'm uh, ahead of myself here, anywhere between zero uh, months after it was produced to 48 months, we've measured the percent of the label strength uh, in that particular sample. Now you see most of the batches started at around 100. And by the time they get to 48, you can see that they've dropped to anywhere between about 92% and um, I don't know, what would that be, about 95% perhaps uh, of the label strength. Well, the question of course is how long can we keep using that drug and be sure that most of the product remains above that specification limit? Okay. Now, the basic approach to establishing a shelf life that the FDA recommends and that we've implemented in our stability studies procedure is the following. We're gonna start by modeling the degradation of drug strength over time. We're gonna fit a statistical model to the data that I just showed you. Now, typically we're gonna use a linear model, but it's also possible to use a nonlinear model if in fact there are nonlinearities present in that particular data. Okay. We'll create a lower prediction limit once we've got the model fit, a lower prediction limit for a specified quantile of the distribution of measurements that we would observe at each point in time. Now, typically the FDA in their guidelines states that you should model, uh, do prediction limits for P50, the 50th percentile. And because we're assuming a normal distribution, that's also the mean, that we do prediction limits for the mean at each point in time. Okay. We then find the intersection of the prediction limits with the specification limit. Now, in this particular case, there's a lower specification limit. It's also possible in other cases that there might be an upper specification limit or both lower and upper specifications. In the case of degradation of a drug, of course, it's the, the lower prediction limit, the lower specification that we're particularly interested in. Okay, so we'll find the intersection of the prediction limit with the specification limit. And then we'll also look at the batches. If there are significant differences between the batches, and for the moment, let's assume that batches have a fixed effect. I'll talk about that a little bit later, okay? If there are significant difference between the batches, then what we do is we create prediction limits for each batch and basically select the worst batch. We select the minimum of the prediction limits for the batch to establish the shelf life or the retest period. Okay, that's going to be the basic approach. We're gonna fit a model. We're gonna get a prediction limit for each batch we're going to find the intersection of the prediction limits for each batch with the specification limit, and we'll err on the conservative side by taking the worst case batch. Okay. Now, at this point, I'd like to go over to Stack Graphics and actually do the analysis for you. So let me switch over to where I'm running Stack Graphics. There it is. Um, here I'm running Stack Graphics 19, and you see I've loaded into the data sheet the file called Shelf Life Study. Now there are three columns in this particular file. There's a column called month, 
okay? That's how many months after the drug was produced have I taken the sample. We then have an indication of the batch number, and I've just numbered them one, two, three, four, five, uh, to make it fairly simple. And for each batch in each month, I've measured the percent of the label strength uh, that we observed in that particular sample. And you see they started out uh, fairly high. Okay, now to do the stability study, I'm going to go to the top menu to relate and pick stability study. Okay, that's going to bring up a uh, data input dialog box, a fairly standard data input dialog box. The response variable that we want to measure is the percent of the drug's label strength. Time is in the column called month, and batch has the batch numbers. Now, batch is an optimal, uh, optimal optional variable. Uh, you don't have to use it. But if you do, you'll see in just a moment that it will fit uh, a separate regression line for each of the batches. We are also going to want in where it's, to put in where it says lower specification limit, the value 90. Okay, that is in this case, the specification limit uh, that I'm interested in. Okay, now on the next screen, you'll see what we tend to call analysis options. The first thing and a very important thing that you need to specify is what percentile you want to look at. Okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do prediction limits for a particular percentile. Now, the 50th percentile is the mean, and you can see that in this build, uh, that is the default value for the percentile. And I'm going to ask it to do 95% confidence limits for that percentile, or in this case, the mean. Okay, and that'll show up on the graph. I also need to tell it how to handle batches. I can either tell it there are no batch effects, or I could say, well, let's look at main effects only. That would assume that the batches, the lines we fit for the batches could have different intercepts, but the slopes would all be the same. The best place to typically start is by fitting both main effects and interactions. That's an interaction between batch and time. Okay, what that amounts to is assuming that the regression lines for each of the batches have different slopes. Okay. Now, there's one other option here, and that is to treat the batches as if they're random effects instead of fixed effects. Okay, I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. For the moment, let's just leave them at fixed effects. Now, over here on the right hand side of the analysis options dialog box, we tell it what type of model we want to fit. Now we can either tell it that by telling it how we'd like to transform the response. If we say no transformation, that's a straight linear model. If I was to pick, for example, square root, I'd be telling it that the square root of my measurement is assumed to be linear with time. Or I could ask for a logarithm or a reciprocal, or I could ask for a Box-Cox transformation. A Box-Cox transformation will actually try a bunch of different powers and find the power that fits the best. We also have a whole set of nonlinear models, all the nonlinear models that we typically fit in simple regression that we could also ask it to fit instead. Okay, well, I always believe in starting simple, so I'm going to start with the straight linear model. It'll now offer me various tables and graphs. 
I'm going to ask for the analysis summary, shelf life estimates, a comparison of alternative models. I'm also going to ask it to look at the shelf life plot, the residuals versus X, and the residual probability plot. Okay, now what that's going to do, that's going to open up an analysis window. And you can see the three tables and the three graphs that I've asked for. Most of what I'm really interested in, you can see in this particular plot. Here you see all the data from the five different batches. And you can see that it's estimated a linear regression, a separate linear regression for each of the batches. They each have their own intercept. They each have their own slope. We then constructed confidence limits. Make sure I get this right. Confidence limits, or in this case, a confidence bound for the mean of each of the batches. But we didn't draw all the confidence bounds. What we did is we drew the lowest confidence bound at each point in time. Now, in most cases, the lowest confidence bound came from the regression on batch three. Although I believe at the very beginning, you can actually see that there was another batch that was a little lower at the very beginning. The bound that you see is the lowest bound at each point amongst the batches. So in some cases, it might be from one batch and other cases from the other batch. Okay. The next thing we've done is we've looked at the bounds, the minimum bound. And we found where that bound intersects the specification limits. That gives us the shelf life. Okay. In this case, the lowest of the confidence limits for the bounds, okay, uh, intersects the specification limit at about 52.8 months. So that would establish for us, in this case, the shelf life or perhaps a retest period, a point after which we need to retest um, all of the products. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. All right, that point should be fairly straightforward. Now, I need to talk a little bit more though about how we handle batches. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I have some um, PowerPoint slides, incidentally. You can see I keep switching from PowerPoint over to Stack Graphics. I've actually already posted these PowerPoint slides uh, on our website. So if you go to stackgraphics.com and you look for the blog, uh, not the blog, the uh, webinars page, uh, you'll see that I've posted these slides. And what I've tried to do is, is show you each of the steps in actually creating and analyzing the shelf life. Okay, now what I wanna do though is I wanna talk about batches. We have a couple choices about how to handle batches. First off, we need to choose between a model where the batches have fixed effects and a model where they have random effects. If we choose the fixed effects model, then what we'll do is we'll fit models with different intercepts and different slopes for each of the batches. All right, we'll simplify that model if the batch slopes or the intercepts are not significantly different. And in a moment, I'll show you where we actually go to test for significant differences between the slopes and the intercepts, okay? If the slopes are not significantly different, it turns out you take out the interaction term. If the intercepts are not significantly different, you take out the main effects. 
Okay. Once you've simplified the model based upon what's significant and what's not, you then determine the shelf life for each batch and select the minimum shelf life to be your final result. Okay, and that's what we did just a moment ago. Okay, there's another choice though. I can also assume that the batches have what are called random effects. If I assume the batches have random effects, I'm essentially assuming that the five batches I've taken are a random sample of many batches that I might produce. Okay. And in that case, what we do is we add the batches and the batch time interactions as additional variance components in the model. Okay. Again, if batch times time interactions or batch components are not statistically significant, they're removed. What happens though is for that sort of a model, and I'm gonna show it to you before I end, uh, it turns out that we fit just one regression line. Okay. And the confidence limits for the mean of that regression line where they intersect the specification, set the shelf life. Now, the reason that works though, is that that confidence limits, the standard errors that we look at, include batch to batch variability. So if there are significant differences between the batches, they expand the distance between the confidence limits. So rather than having to do a shelf life for each batch, we do a single shelf life using a model that incorporates batch to batch variability. Okay. Well, um, let's go back to the model that we were just looking at. The model we were just looking at had fixed batch effects. Okay, and if I go back to stat graphics and I go to the analysis summary, that's right up here you'll see down toward the bottom of that a further analysis for variables in the order fitted. And well, let me go back to my PowerPoint slide. I just wanted to show you where to get it. That further analysis of variance table has three rows in it. It has a row for month, a row for batch, and a row for month times batch. Now, what we would do uh, if we did, wanted to simplify this model is we'd use what's called a backward stepwise approach. We'd work from the bottom up. We begin by looking at the most complicated term in the model, and that is the month times batch interaction. The month times batch interaction tests whether slopes of the batches are significantly different from each other. And you can see in this particular table, there is a p-value for the month times batch interaction. Now, normally when you're looking at regressions and p-values, if you're operating at the 5% significance level, you'll call the interaction significant if the p-value is less than 0.05. However, if you look at the FDA guidance, the FDA recognizes that samples used to fit these models are typically fairly small, right? I had five batches is all I looked at, okay? So the FDA suggests you use an alpha of 0.25, that you don't remove a term unless the p-value is greater than 0.25. Reason being that these small samples don't have an, all that much power. So even though the month times batch interaction may not be statistically significant at the 5% level, that doesn't guarantee it's not there. Okay, and they'd like you to be somewhat conservative and not remove terms 
unless you get a P of 0.25 or greater. Well, there's no question here that month times batch interaction is statistically significant, so I would not want to simplify the model. And remember, it was the analysis options dialog box where I specified the model. Let's suppose, though, that number was greater than 0.25. What I do is I'd go back to analysis options, I'd remove the interactions, and I'd refit. Then I'd come back to this table and look again at the term for batch. The batch term tests whether intercepts of the batches are significantly different from one another. Okay. Uh, if they're not, and again, we're going to operate at 0.25, we could remove the main effects of the batches. Okay. Uh, and get back to a main effect. Um, well, no, a, a model that doesn't even uh, uh, account for batch effects. Okay. Well, in this case, we don't want to simplify it. Uh, the p-values are, are quite significant. All right, let's go back to stack graphics. A couple other things I need to show you. Uh, first thing I need to show you here is the shelf life estimates. There is a pane um, on the analysis window that shows you what the shelf life estimates were for each of the five batches. I hope you can see this. The shelf life estimates range from a high of about 74.8 months to a low of 52.8 months. And since we're using a fixed effects model, we're going to take the minimum of those, 52.8, as our overall shelf life. Okay, so that pain is uh, is interesting. Again, you saw it on the graph, but it's nice to have a table of it. Okay, now, this is all based, of course, on assuming that the relationship is linear, that the relationship between the measurement that I've taken and time is linear. It may be or it may not be. Well, those of you who've done regression analyses in the past know that it's particularly important to look at the residuals whenever you're doing any sort of regression modeling. Here you see a plot of the studentized residuals versus month. Studentized residuals tell me how many standard deviations each point is away from its fitted line. Okay, you'll notice actually that there is one uh, residual here that's about minus 2.86 standard deviations. That, that's pretty far away. It's not beyond three, so I'm not terribly concerned about it, but it is relatively large. What I'm a little more concerned about is the fact that these five batches at 36 months all have negative residuals. And these five batches at 48 months all have positive residuals. What that means, particularly let's look at the 48 month residuals, is that all the observed values were above their respective lines. Now, the reason that might concern me is that that might imply that the model has gone down too far at 48 months. And the implication of that is that I might get a lower shelf life than I could really justify if I used some nonlinear model. Okay, now it means I'm erring on the conservative side, of course, but. Uh, you know, it might mean money to me <laughs> to be able to justify a longer shelf life. And there definitely is some suggestion here 
that the points are above the line at 48 months. Okay, I'm also going to look at something called the residual probability plot. The residual probability plot plots these studentized residuals on a scale where if the data all come from a single normal distribution, which is my assumption, these points should lie approximately along a straight line. Well, they're not terrible. What you're looking for in these residual probability plots is some obvious curvature, uh, maybe at one end or another, to indicate that the data are not normally distributed. Um, they're not perfect. They're a little bit off the line in the tails, but that's not, uh, not too unusual. Okay, well, um, what concerns me the most actually is this residual plot here, where the points all seem to have positive residuals at 48. Now, we have built into stack graphics, I think, as I indicated to you, the ability to fit nonlinear models. And one of the pains that I asked for when I first came into the stability study was a comparison of alternative models. That is a comparison of various what are called transformable nonlinear models. Okay, transformable nonlinear models um, basically take some transformation of either Y or X or both and fit a straight line to the transformed values. Now, what we have done here is fit a lot of models. Now, there were a number that couldn't be fit because we had zeros for X, and you can't take a log of zero. So some of the models involving transformations of X, we couldn't fit. But all the models we could fit, the, lin uh, the reciprocal Y, had the highest R squared statistic. It had a 95.68% R squared statistic as opposed to 95.4% for the linear model. That's not much different. You know, a couple um, 0 0.2, 4.28% on an R squared uh, is not a dramatic change that I'd be, been hoping for. But regardless, let's go see what would happen if I tried a reciprocal model. Now, take a look at the linear model. I'm back here. The shelf life was 52.8, right? I'm now going to push the right mouse button, go to analysis options, and ask it to take the reciprocal of Y. The reciprocal transformation is the reciprocal Y model. Okay, well, now what it's done is it's fit some nonlinear models to each of the batches. If you look real close, you can see that there is now a little bit of curvature in each of those lines. Well, the effect of that was to bring the shelf life up a little bit, up to 54.5 months. And if you look at the residuals, well, now the residuals are all negative, okay, rather than positive. The reason for that, though, incidentally, is I took the reciprocal of Y. I took one over Y. So what was positive before becomes negative. Um, so it it's still missing at the high, it's still missing on the same side. It's just the transformation uh, has switched it one over Y. So we now see it at the bottom. Um, I think they do look a little closer to the line uh, than they looked before. Okay. However, that was not a dramatic change. Now, one other possibility, and I think I mentioned this when I started. Let me go back to my PowerPoint slides for a moment. We had the comparison of alternative models. One other possibility is to try something called a box 
Cox transformation. A box Cox transformation considers models in which some power of y, y raised to the p power, PowerPoint didn't do very well with the exponent, but that means y to the power p, is a linear function of x. And in the op box Cox transformation, we will search for an optimal value of p. Okay, we actually had used uh, one of these power transformations where p was minus one, right? Reciprocal is y to the minus one. Um, that may not be the best transformation. So I can go back to stack graphics, here it is. And instead of on the analysis options dialog box asking for a reciprocal transformation, I can ask for a box Cox transformation. Okay, now you'll see if you look up here in the analysis options, uh, I'm sorry, the analysis summary, that it found that the power minus 3.65 was according to the box Cox procedure, which tries to minimize the mean squared error. That's the basic idea of the box Cox transformation. Raising y to the minus 3.65 power. Uh, gave the minimum uh, the best fit. As far as shelf life is concerned, uh, that amounts to a shelf life a little larger even at about 56.9 months. Okay, so if you wanted to try the Box-Cox procedure, um, it would in this case give you uh, the greatest result. Okay. Now, um, that's what I wanted to show you with respect to handling batches as fixed effects. Okay. We also, though, have the ability to handle batches as random effects. In a random effects model, we basically incorporate batches and batch interactions, interactions with time, as additional sources of variability in the model. Okay, it's a different approach. Rather than fitting separate models to each of the five batches that I have and taking basically the worst batch, in a random effects model, I incorporate the batches as a source of variability. Well, it turns out if you do that, you then get one single regression line that applies to all the batches. Well, not just these five batches, but potentially data from many, many, many batches. Okay, You get one single confidence bound, and you find the intersection of that confidence bound with the specification. Now that's easy to do. Let me go back to stack graphics. Let me go back to analysis options. Let me turn off my transformation, but down here, ask it to treat the batches as random effects. Okay, there it goes. It did a fit. Uh, and this is the longest shelf life uh, of all the models. It estimates in that case a shelf life of about 61 months. And if you want to see what statistically it did, you can come over here to the analysis summary. And right here at the top is the variance components table. In this case, it's added batches and batch times month as additional sources of variability. There's always a lot of sources of variability in your residuals, right? You always have measurement error and who knows, humidity, uh, variations in raw material. There's always lots of sources of variability whenever we fit a regression. 
We've added now two additional sources of variability, a batch, which amounts to differences between the levels or the intercepts of the batches, and month times batch, which is essentially differences in the slopes. They're added here though, not as fixed effects, but as variance components. And again, if these numbers here indicated a lack of significance, and remember the FDA talks about 0.25 as being the, the point at which you could remove them, um, we could, if we wanted, simplify the model. And it's not a bad model. It has an R squared of about 95.16 and um, gives me, in this case, a shelf life of about 61 months. Okay, well, that's a um, um, general overview of what we do in our stability analysis procedure. Uh, again, I've posted the slides on our website. As soon as I'm done here, I'll also post a recording of this video. And um, you can see a lot of uh, additional videos on our website. I'm gonna take questions in just a second, but let me also uh, point out to you some general references here. Um, what, where we went um, when we coded up this stability study is we went first to a book by Chow uh, called Statistical Design and Analysis of Stability Studies. Uh, if you want uh, a sound statistical treatment of what's going on here, take a look at that book. Um, I have mentioned a little bit about the guidance from the FDA with respect to how you handle batches. Uh, there are two publications. You can find both of those online. Um, one has to do with uh, stability testing of new drugs and substances and products. And the second followed on about a year later with some more details on the analysis evaluation of stability data. Okay, well, good. That was about 45 minutes. That was my goal. Let, let me go ahead now and take the questions. Let's see what sort of questions we had and uh, how many of those I can, I can ask, answer. Okay, at the top. Um, first question. Uh, I can't see the whole question here. Oh, there we go. First question was, if I select main effects only in the analysis options box, does it assume a common slope and a common intercept? Yes. Okay, on that analysis options dialog box, and let me just show it to you again, right? On the analysis options dialog box, uh, no batch effects assumes that all batches have the same intercept and the same slope. Main effects only allows for different intercepts, but assumes common slopes. And main effects and interactions, uh, well, they all have their own intercepts and slopes. Okay. Another question. Would stack graphics have a similar solution for decays over time that are non-linear? Absolutely. For example, the degradation of a spindle can increase exponentially. The remaining useful life would go down exponentially versus linearly. Can I use this solution to identify its shelf life or read operational life? Absolutely. Um, we have coded this procedure to be flexible. First off, you'll notice on the data input dialog box, right? We allow for an upper specification in addition to a lower specification, right? The, the stability studies are not used just for drugs. You know, they're widely used for drugs, but they're used for lots and lots and lots of other types of products too. I mean, you can see the approach is, is quite general. Sometimes you'll have a lower spec, 
Sometimes you'll have an upper spec, sometimes you'll have both. Okay. Also, if it did increase exponentially, if you go to analysis options, you could go and choose an alternative model and you can see one of the alternative models is an exponential model. That means that y goes up exponentially with x. Okay, we also have a uh, um one in which uh basically we have exponential behavior with respect to the log of x, a number of different types of nonlinear models. So yes, you can certainly handle uh, other types of products, you can handle upper specification limits, and you can certainly handle exponential growth uh, or decay or whatever, if that's what you happen to have. Any other questions? All right, as usual, I invite you all to send me questions as you think of them. Uh, my email is just neil, N-E-I-L, at statgraphics.com. I'd be happy to answer any other questions. Um, the sample data set is shipped with version 19, so you've got that. The slides and the recording will be posted in, in, in a couple hours. Well, thanks again. I'll let you know when the next webinar is going to happen.